Good morning. Welcome to our service today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's been a beautiful last couple of days. We've got a wonderful day ahead of us as we uh, continue to live and serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, let's begin with, from Scripture here. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, it says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And that's every day, right? It's not just when things get really, really bad that we need Jesus, but we need him every day. Amen. And uh, we have the great privilege of coming before our God through our intercessor, Jesus Christ. And so join with me at this time. Let's approach the throne of grace as Scripture tells us here to do so with confidence in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together this morning as we God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace that you have freely made available to us in your son, Jesus Christ. And through the salvation that you've provided in him, you have given us eternal life. You have forgiven our sins. We have the hope of heaven. And we have the wonderful blessing that as we uh, go through this life, Lord, at, at any time, at any place, in any moment, we can come before you. We can come with confidence, as Scripture says here, not in ourselves, but confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ and the righteousness of our Savior. And so this morning, we, we come in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We come before your throne, God. You are sovereign. You are God over all that you have created. And we come before you as humble servants to worship you in this hour, to hear from your word, to be instructed in our lives, to be challenged, Lord, to be faithful to you. Lord, in all the things that you've called us to do, May you help us and strengthen us to be faithful. And we want to give you the praise and, and the honor and glory for all, uh, all that you will accomplish in and through our lives and all of the things that you're doing in this world. And we want to give you praise. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Steve Carwana is going to come and lead us this morning as we stand to sing, Good and Gracious King. Uh, the very first line there, I approach the throne of glory. We come before God in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's lift up our voices and sing together.
next hymn is Alleluia, What a Savior. Chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Jesus is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice and do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years, therefore I was provoked, excuse me, therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. 
and we just pray the Holy Spirit would help us to understand them, to apply them to our lives, help us to examine our hearts, Lord, um, help us to be confident in you, our King. Lord, in this world today, with many turbulent things always going on, Lord, it's good to know we have an anchor that holds fast, a light to guide us through the darkness and to lead us in the paths of truth and righteousness. We just thank you that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, the one who created the house, and we are his creations. We just pray this morning for those that are, are ill, maybe attacked or affected by the pandemic, pray for health and recovery, pray for all the other things and illnesses that go on in our lives. But most of all, Lord, this morning, we pray for the message that we will hear and the words that we will hear, that we'll be able to take them with us in the days and weeks ahead. In your name we pray, Lord. One more hymn this morning, Speak, O Lord. We'll stand as we sing and we'll have the children dismissed for here your church. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn the Old Testament to 1 Samuel chapter 27 as we continue here in our series through the book of 1 Samuel. The late Ravi Zacharias, who is perhaps one of the greatest apologists of, of our lifetimes, once said, referring to the slippery slope that is the way of sin, he said that sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you there longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. And that thought illustrates what Solomon writes in Proverbs 27, verse 20. He says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. In our lives, unless held in check by 
God and His Word, sin has a way of creating within us unquenchable desires that will pull us onto a slippery slope that will ultimately end in destruction. Desires in a, in a way that, that cannot be satisfied, always leaving us wanting more. And this morning, I want to examine what we can learn here in 1 Samuel 27 from one of David's failures and how we can learn from those failures and how we can stay off of the slippery slope of unbelief. I've entitled this, Staying Off of the Slippery Slope of Unbelief. And as we get started, I want to uh, try to clearly explain what I mean by the idea of unbelief. You know, the slippery slope is that um, once you get on that path of sin, you very easily progress further and further and further that slippery slope. And even if you want to try and stop, uh, it is not easy, uh, easy to get off of that path in our own strength. That's why we need God in His Word to hold those desires in check and to uh, keep us on the solid foundation. Staying off of the slippery slope of unbelief, what I want to talk about this morning uh, is not so much an agnostic or an atheistic um, kind of unbelief in which a person that holds this, uh, this um, type of belief of, of agnosticism or atheism in which they reject even the very notion of God. What I want to talk about this morning when I use the word unbelief is the kind of unbelief that creeps into the believer's heart. This, the temptation that Satan puts before us to doubt God, to doubt His Word. That's the unbelief I want to talk about. Of course, there's principles here that can refer to the other kinds of unbelief where we might call somebody an unbeliever because they have not trusted in Jesus Christ. There is a sense in which that unbelief also, there is a slippery slope in that sense. But what we're focusing here this morning on is the unbelief that cre can creep into our hearts and can, can very quickly uh, do great damage in our lives uh, if we give place to that unbelief in our hearts and our minds. It's the kind of unbelief that we see when you look in Genesis at the Garden of Eden when Satan brought the attack to Adam and Eve when he said, Yea, hath God said. And that question created doubt in their heart and minds, and it, it, it very quickly led to sin. It's the kind of unbelief that Jesus challenged when He and His disciples were in the boat. They were going across the sea. And if you remember uh, this particular instance, uh, there was a turbulent storm and the boat was about to sink and the disciples are fearing for their lives and they're looking around at each other, but where's Jesus? And they go and they find Jesus asleep, right? And they wake Jesus from His sleep and they say, Master, don't you care about us that we are going to die? And Jesus says, O oh, ye of what? Little faith. There are times in all of our lives when we are faced with that kind of doubt. That temptation to question God, His goodness, His grace, His purposes. There are times in all of our lives when we, like the disciples, are of little faith, aren't we? We probably don't think about the slippery slope of sin in regards to unbelief very often, but this morning we see evidence of that in David's life and we want to learn from the failures that he made in our own lives so that we do not go down that same path ourselves. And so we're going to look at David's descent this morning as we begin, and we're going to look at five things that we see here in this account that show us David progressing down this slippery slope that begins with just the seed of unbelief and then blossoms as that progresses and becomes more significant and severe in his own life. And then once we've seen that, I want to go back and I want to see from his failure how we can learn and how we can avoid going down that same path ourselves. And so as we look at 1 Samuel chapters 27, and if you're keeping score, uh, you probably um, know that the last couple of Sundays that we've been here in 1 Samuel, we were actually in chapter 25. Uh, where David has been hiding in the wilderness of Paran, uh, which is the same wilderness that the Israelites spent their 40 years of wandering when they failed to obey God and enter into the promised land. The passage that Frank just read in our scripture reading there in Hebrews chapter 3 talks about if you hear his voice today, do not harden your hearts as they did in the day of the great 
rebellion. That's what the author of Hebrews is talking about when they disobeyed God's instructions under the leadership of Moses. They did not go into the promised land, and as a result, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That wilderness is the same wilderness that we read about here in 1 Samuel where David has been finding refuge from Saul's pursuit to kill him. And so he and his men have been in the wilderness of Paran. Uh, it's a wilderness that extends, if you know uh, biblical times geography or can try and imagine just a little bit, uh, far in the north of Israel, uh, or far in the north of the wilderness, the far north of that, of the wilderness is uh, marked near Petra in Kadesh Barnea. And that wilderness then would extend south uh, down almost to Mount Sinai, uh, which is just uh, west of the uh, Sinai Peninsula, and then to the west of that, then you have Egypt, right? And the children of Israel, as they left Egypt, they went across the Red Sea, and eventually they ended up uh, at Mount Sinai. And so that wilderness of, of Paran was, was quite expansive, and David is now uh, in, in, in an unlikely place finding refuge from King Saul. It's in that wilderness in chapter 25 where David and his men have served Nabal's herdsmen and provided protection for them to secure them while they were tending their flocks in that area where David had been hiding. We spent that time there in chapter 25. Chapter 26, which we're not going to spend a lot of time in this morning, uh, gives us an account of the second time when David is brought into close proximity with King Saul Unknown to King Saul, but David is in very close proximity to him and has an opportunity to take his revenge and to take Saul's life and then to claim the throne for which he has now been anointed to succeed King Saul. But just like in chapter 24, which we've already spent time examining in great detail, David says that he is not going to extend his hand and put his hand out against the Lord's anointed. And he spares Saul's life and prohibits his men from taking any course of action to cause harm to King Saul. We looked at those principles that, that are shared between those two passages back when we were going through chapter 24. This morning I want to begin reading in chapter 26 because it gives us some, uh, some context for what we're going to look at in chapter 27. So if you look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 26, and beginning in verse 21, David has had that close encounter with King Saul. This time, instead of being in a cave hidden secretly and having Saul walk in unknowingly there, this time David and one of his men have snuck into the camp of the Israelite army to find that all of the soldiers have been underneath the deep sleep that God has given to them. And he walks up and he has an opportunity to take Saul's life, but instead he takes Saul's spear. Uh, and then they retreat, and he calls out and, and, and identifies what basically what has taken place. And that's where we pick up in chapter 26. If you look with me in verse 21, it says, Then Saul said, and this was after David had already called to them and, and told them that, um, that he has been in the camp. The soldiers have failed to protect their king. He had the opportunity, but he did not take it. Verse 21, Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will no more do you harm because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may He deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things, and you will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. And then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. You recall Gath is the location from which Goliath, Goliath of Gath, this was Goliath's home city. Now uh, host to the king of the Philistines at this time, 
Achish, David is going to go now in a very um, unlikely place again. David lived with Achish at Gath. Every man with his household and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in a royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now, David and his men went up and made raids against the Jeshurites, the Gerzites, and the Malachites. These were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as sure to the land of Egypt. David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, Where have you made a raid today? David would say, Against the Negev of Judah, or against Negev of the Jeremites, or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man or woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking, Lest they should tell about us and say, So David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. As we look here at this text, I want us to be careful that we do not miss the significance of what takes place there in verse 1 of chapter 27. Because it's here that we find the seed of unbelief begin to blossom in David's heart and mind that then will lead him down a dark path as we read throughout this chapter. In chapter 26 and verse 24, if you look just back before we get to the beginning of chapter 27, David declares there in verse 24, Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may He deliver me out of How many of his tribulations? All. May the Lord deliver me out of all of my tribulations. And then in a very short amount of time, immediately following this grand display of faith, what does David say? I am surely going to die. There is no hope for me. There are no other options except that I flee to the land of my enemies. When we read this, we have to be careful that we don't see it simply as pragmatic strategy that works. And to a certain extent, it does work, doesn't it? David's desire, his intent here in chapter 27 is to be delivered from the immediate pressure and pursuit of King Saul that has been over his life. He wants to be free of that in his life there here in this moment. And to that end, as he flees to the land of the Philistines, to to Gath, to Achish, uh, the king of the Philistines, to that end, he succeeds. Because as we read right almost immediately in chapter 27, as soon as he gets there and Saul learns of it, he stops pursuing him. And David is no longer under that pressure. But this is so much more than just a pragmatic strategy that works. Because it's actually uh, unbelief taking root in David's heart. David has been under immense pressure for for many days as Saul has been seeking to take his life. And he comes to a place where just maybe a day, a short amount of time, we don't know. All Scripture says is this is what's happening in chapter 26. And then David is now in despair. He's on the mountaintop of, of triumphant faith. And then we move one verse. He's in a pit of despair. And he's under this immense pressure that he's been enduring. And he begins to allow this doubt, this unbelief, to begin to have effect on his life. And it begins to take him down this path. In verse 1, we see that this doubt that, that 
um, takes hold in his life, it, it begins as a very small root, but it begins to blossom. And this morning I want to look at the path of sin that David begins to go down that is all traced back to the doubt that is in verse 1. If you look with me here at, at this passage, or as we walk back now again through this text, the first thing that we see on this slippery slope of unbelief in David's life. Now, let me pause right here before we actually put this up on the screen. Uh, this slippery slope of unbelief, this is not a, this is the only way that it happens, one, two, three, four, in, in a logical progression. The slippery slope of unbelief or of sin in any of our lives can happen in any dif- any any various kinds of order, but it always is progressing and taking you further and further and further away from the Lord. I've put these things in this order as we see them in the text. They're not in in chronological order, so to speak, or in uh, in a progressive order uh, like you might experience or I might experience, but this is just simply what, as I have studied through the passage, this is the order that, that I have identified them working through the passage. But the first thing I want us to look at here this morning that we see on this slippery slope of unbelief as the seed of doubt is in, in David's heart and mind, you look at this chapter as a whole, it is glaringly obvious that the one thing that is missing here in this chapter that we see so many times in David's life is a lack of prayer. A prayerlessness. And this is quite often one of the first things that does happen in our own lives when when unbelief or doubt takes root in our hearts and our minds. Uh, This is very close behind. If not first, it's very close behind. We stop talking to God. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, when they doubted God's goodness, when they doubted God's Word and His instructions, what did they do? They ran and hid from God. Though they were in such close communion with God that they walked and talked with God in the cool of the garden on a regular basis. It was something that was a part of their lives, but they sinned and they hid. You don't have to look very hard here to see that that David did not seek God's wisdom and guidance. Because you read through this passage, the only thing that David actually consults is his own mind. It says that here, he said in his heart. He, he reasoned in his mind to himself. Essentially, is the, verse 1 is giving us kind of the insight into the, the conversation that David had in his own head as he reasoned in his own heart or he reasoned with himself, self, we don't have any other hope. We don't have any other options. The only thing that I have left to do is to be to the Philistines. This was the counsel that David took, and it was just simply with himself. We see here a prayerlessness. The second thing that we see here in this text is a direct disobedience to the Lord's instructions. If we were to take the time and go back to chapter 22, and maybe you remember a little bit of this, It was the time in David's life when he went from being just a lone fugitive from King Saul to now being the commander of peoples. People that were disenfranchised from Israel, those that were debtors, those that had been persecuted under Saul's reign. They had fled from from their homes and from wherever they were, uh, were hiding and they aligned themselves with David. And now he's got a small army and a small group of followers whom he has now become their commander. And at that period of time, they're hiding in the fortresses uh, on, uh, outside of, uh, of the land of Judah. They had found a place of security, of, of a fortress to protect. And now he's got a group of people of which he is a commander. And at this strategic time in the story, God sends a prophet named Gad to David with very specific instructions from the Lord. And very simply, the only thing that's recorded uh, that, that Gad says to David Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. God never intended for David to leave the land of Judah. God's very clear instructions for David and for his people were to remain in the land. Was Saul pursuing them? Yes. Was it dangerous in that land? Yes, was it difficult uh, to find provisions and to, uh, like we saw in chapter 25, the, the things that they wanted to do with the feast, uh, the, the national feast that was coming up, this festival? Did they have resources for all those things? 
Not necessarily. But what were God's instructions? To go down into the land of Judah. With the implication being, God's instructions, His uh, will for David was that he stayed in the land with the people. But here we find that he makes the choice to flee to Gath in order to seek refuge from Saul. When you look at verse 1, what I see here is that he uses this pragmatic reasoning to justify his disobedience against the Lord's instructions. I don't have any other hope. I know that I should stay where I'm at, but if I go, then this good will happen. Right? I know I shouldn't do this in my life. I know that God says that it's sin, but if I do this, then this good positive result is going to happen. You ever thought that or use that kind of thinking to try and con- to convince yourself to go ahead and do it anyways? It, it's, it's, pra- it's a pragmatic reasoning. Uh, pragmatism says that the end justifies the means. It's okay to do wrong in order for good to happen. But it's never okay, is it, to do something wrong in order to get a good result. The end never justifies the means. David is going down this slippery slope. It began with just a simple doubt. I, I have, I'm going to die. I don't have any other option. And now we see this progression. The third thing that we see here in this text is theft. David now living in a foreign land where he should have never been. He has to resort to raiding and plundering surrounding areas in order to secure provisions for himself, for his people, for their households, and then also we find to, to help secure favor with King, of a- with, with King Achish uh, of the Philistines. In these raids, it says that they took great plunder of, of all sorts of things and flocks and, and herds. And great plunder. But the reality is, is that it was all stolen goods. He was never given instructions by God to go and to do these things. He was in a place where he should not have been. He was living outside the boundaries of God's will for his life. And once again, we could say that justifying these actions, he could have said, well, yes, I'm doing this, but it's providing for our people. But the very clear Law of God in Exodus 20.15, which David would have known very, very specifically. Thou shalt not steal. David was operating in sinful territory on a very slippery slope because number four, what we read here in this text is he's committing murder time and time again. More than just plundering these cities and the lands, David is killing every last man and woman and perhaps even the children because it says he left no one alive to report what has been happening. War, armies, it's kind of a difficult subject to deal with. There are times in Scripture where God sends His people especially in the Old Testament when we look at somebody like David, the armies of Israel going into the land of Canaan where God gave them righteous and true and pure instructions to go and to defeat the inhabitants of the land and to wipe them out entirely and to leave no one left. These were people who were directly opposed to God and His people and God in His sovereignty gave those kinds of instructions. There are times, there are uh, battles and wars in our day and age that are unrighteous and unjust, but at the same time, God uses armies and rulers and soldiers to accomplish his purposes. And so there are, uh, there are also uh, the, the reality that war is a part of God's sovereign plan. And in that sense, it also can be used for good. But this was not a righteous war cleansing the land of those who were in outright opposition to God's people. Because what we'll see here in just a moment, David's choice to murder and to kill all of these people, it was a tactic of self-preservation. So that nobody could get back to King Achish and report what he was doing. Because surely if King Achish found out what he was doing and who he was plundering, 
his new ally would now be turned into a renewed enemy. And so we go to number five. This, in many ways, may not be seen as a more severe descent into sin, but it is the last thing that we see here in the text. Is that David resorts to deception and lying. He had sought refuge from King Achish. He had secured land for his people. But in order to provide for those that were with him, he begins raiding these outlying territories. And it's mentioned there in the text that we read about. Uh, most of the names we, most, we probably aren't familiar with and don't. We, we, we have a hard time uh, understanding what's taking place here because he raided, it says it gives a list of three places where he raided and he did this. This was his course of action the entire time for a year and four months. This is what David was doing. He was spending his time going into those places and raiding them. But then when King Achish asked, where, where, where have you raided? He knew he was doing the raiding. That wasn't necessarily part of the deception. He knew he was doing the raiding, but King Achish, where have you raided today? And David would tell them a, diff- he would tell them a different location. And basically, to simplify it as best as I can, David was raiding the the bordering um, the border territories of the Philist- Philistine territory, or those that were just on the other side of the border that were allies of the Philistines. He was that's where he was raiding. But when King Achish asked him what he was doing, he says he was raiding the border territories of Israel of Judah. Basically, is what he's, to, he's, he's raiding the southernmost portions of Judah, the territories that would have been uh, allies with Israel. And so in King Achish's mind, he sees, because of this deception, he thinks David is now our ally. He's actually killing his own people and robbing them, but in reality. And so that's the murder part, the, the self-preservation. And he uses this lie to ensure that he's not found out because if King Achish finds out, Surely, he would not let that go. And so he kills every man, woman, and child and uses this deception to secure and to maintain Achish's favor in their time there. All of this darkness in David's life was born out of the seed of unbelief that we read about there and identified in verse 1. Surely, I'm going to die and there is no hope for me. It's nothing more than doubt. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. We read it in our scripture reading as well this morning. The church is exhorted take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. When you look at verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 27 and what David is, is crying out here or what he's reasoning with himself is a departure from the living God, isn't it? I have no hope. There are no other options. I'm going to die. There's nothing left for me to do except for to, to take things into my hand and to go find refuge with my enemies. I mean, where is God in that line of thinking? The one who has delivered him. Take heed, brothers. Because the temptation of unbelief comes to all of us, doesn't it? The the temptation to doubt, it comes to all of us. And what you actually find in life is that it quite often comes when you're on the mountaintops of victories. You're at the high. Because when you're on the mountaintop of victory, we oftentimes we let down our guard. We think everything's good, everything's where it ought to be. I'll let down my guard. I don't have to watch out for the enemy because we've just had this great victory in our lives. God has blessed us in this mighty way. We let down our guards and that's when the enemy strikes. And so often this temptation of doubt and unbelief, it comes in very subtly. Well, it's not that big a deal. Let's just figure out now what to do next. And we begin to do exactly what David does when we are faced with a problem or an uncertainty in our lives. One of the first things that we do is we say, okay, let's figure out what to do now. And if that is the course that we go without acknowledging God, we have entered down this path that will, if we continue on it, will take us further and further and further away from the Lord. So what can we learn from David's failures here? There's five things that I want us to learn here. I believe that they're extremely practical. um, And we see, we learn from David's failures, the things that he did not do here. 
we can do in our own lives to keep off of the slippery slope of unbelief. And so when you're faced with the temptation of unbelief or to doubt God and His goodness or to doubt His Word or His purposes in your life because of what's happening in your uh, context of your life, one of the first things that we ought to do is to remember God's faithfulness. Despite David's ongoing desperate situation, continually being pursued by King Saul under the threat of death and assassination, God had always been faithful to David, hadn't he? David says in verse 1, my only hope is this. But time and time again, God had proven his faithfulness. David testifies this before King Saul, actually, in 1 Samuel 17, 37. David said, The Lord who delivered me from the power of the lion and from the power of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. What is David saying here? God has been faithful in the past. He will be faithful today. The threat may be different today than it was, but I know that God has been faithful. And what you will learn and what we will see when we call to mind God's faithfulness is that the God who has always been faithful to you in the past will be faithful even in your greatest time of need. He is unchanging. He is always faithful. Amen? And so when you're faced with the the doubt, it it comes and we all have those moments. What do we do? I'm not going to listen to doubt. I'm not going to listen to that temptation because I know God has been faithful. And and very practically speaking, you could sit down with a piece of paper and you could write out, God has been faithful to me at this point in my life. And this is what God has done. And if you're struggling to, to get beyond that doubt or that unbelief in your mind, just start writing out all of the times that God has proven himself faithful and go back in your memory as far as you can and just start writing them out. And and I believe and has been my own experience when you begin to rehearse the faithfulness of God in your life, the doubt just begins to disappear and go away. And all you're left with with is just uh, unrefutable evidence of God's faithfulness in your life. Remember the faithfulness of God. Number two, call on the promises of God. Call on them. Declare them back to God. God, this is what you have said in your word. These are the promises that you have made. This is who you have said that you are in our times of need or in our times of trouble. This is what David actually did at other times in his life. In Psalm 54, verses 4 and 5, chapter 54 is a period of time when, if you remember the, the chapter when we talked about the rock of escape, David has been betrayed by those who, whom he had been loyal to, those whom he had helped. And they betray him unto King Saul. And now King Saul comes to pursue them. David's on one side of the mountain. Saul's on the other side of the mountain. uh, Very quickly closing in, about to capture them. Psalm 54 is written in the period of time as David is, is, uh, is rushing to get away from King Saul. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness put an end. To them. God is my helper, the upholder of my life. This is the promise that Moses spoke to the children of Israel, having gone through the 40 years of wandering, about to go into the land of Canaan now. He says this to Israel as Joshua is going to take over the mantle of leadership of Israel. Deuteronomy 31 6 Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For the Lord, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. When you find yourself faced with the temptation of doubt, of uncertainty, of unbelief, rehearse God's faithfulness, make a list. Go to God's Word. Find His promises. Write them out. Find them. Speak them back to God. Not as though you are putting God to the test, as Scripture says that we ought not to do. But God is faithful. 
And He is dependable. And if He has said that He is going to do these things, we can have the assurance that He is. And, and it, is, it is entirely right and good for us to say, God, You have said this in Your Word. Prove Your faithfulness in my, in, in my life in this situation. I trust and believe that You are who You say You are and that You will do what You will say You will do. Call on the promises of God. Number three, obey God's instructions. When you're faced with the temptation of doubt uh, and uncertainty or the doubt of doubt and, and unbelief, just simply choose to do what is right. And it may lead you down a path that is unclear and uncertain of what may lie out in front of you, but what you can be sure of is that if you, if you do what you know is right, what God has instructed you to do, you will never go off course from following Him. God is never going to lead you down a path of disobedience against His Word or against the leading of His Holy Spirit. It is never God's will for you to do what is wrong, to sin. It is always God's will for us to be obedient. Isaiah 33, verse 6 says, And He will be the stability or the solid foundation of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. We may not understand how or why, but when all else seems to be unknown or uncertain, when, when everything else may be in doubt, you know that if you choose to do what is right and to obey God, you are on the right path. Remember God's faithfulness. Call on God's promises. Obey God's instructions. Number four, Listen to the exhortation of faithful friends. We read it in Hebrews already. I want to go back again now, but emphasize verse 13. Take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But, should that time come, or even when that time is not directly in front of us, even in times when it seems like it's everything's going the way that it should be, God's people exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. David, in one sense, was not alone here in this time in his life, was he? He had 600 men as his soldiers. That was his army. It also says that he had their households. He had family. His wives were with him. His men. This was a, a rather large group of people that now David is in charge of that, that were with him in this city, Ziklag. And so in one sense, he was not alone. But in another sense, you, when you look at especially verse 1 and, and what then transpires, David was most certainly in a very lonely time in his life, wasn't he? Because he doesn't consult friends, military advisors. He consults his own self. He reasoned within his own heart. Now, because of circumstances, we know that he couldn't be near his closest friend, could he? But Jonathan had spoken into David's life many times and in very powerful ways. If you look back at the last words that Jonathan spoke to David, they were these. Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. And as Jonathan was speaking these words to David, it wasn't just you know, telling him what he wanted to hear. He was speaking in full confidence of the promises of God Jonathan was reassuring David of the faithfulness of God. Don't doubt. Don't fear. God is going to protect you. My Father will not find you. And you will become king. When you find yourself starting to struggle with unbelief or lack of faith, find a faithful friend who's going to encourage you in the Lord. Don't go to somebody who's going to tell you what they think you want to hear, even though that's what we want to hear, right? We always want somebody to tell us what we want to hear to make us feel better about the decisions we're making in life. But that kind of friend, if we want to call it that, is not really helping you. Well, I, I, I don't want to 
continue being faithful to my spouse. There are friends who will tell you, well, you deserve to be happy. Go ahead and divorce or get involved in this wrong relationship. But a faithful friend is going to tell you, no, don't do that. That's wrong. Find your help in the Lord. A faithful friend is going to encourage you in the Lord, even if that means telling you something that might be hurtful or that you don't want to hear. That's what Jonathan was to David. You may not have that friend immediately close to you, but if they are a faithful friend, I, I believe that they have probably already spoken those kind of things into your life, haven't they? A faithful friend. What's more, is that a part of the body of Christ and the local church, though they may not be your best friends, you have people all around you right now who God has placed in your life to be those kind of faithful friends. And so maybe it's not calling your best friend like Jonathan and David, but it's calling somebody who loves you that's a part of your church that maybe doesn't know all the details that you're going through, but it will, will speak encouragement in the Lord into your life. From the other side of, the, of, of the, the situation, as God's people, God has put us into this place, into these relationships. And part of our charge is to, every day as it says there in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 3, as long as it is called today, right? This is what we ought to be looking to do. To exhorting one another, uh, to encourage one another, so that, so that somebody doesn't go down this path of unbelief so that their heart isn't hardened by sin, to encourage and to exhort one another as faithful friends in the Lord. And so daily, we ought to be looking for opportunities to encourage one another. Give somebody a call. Make a visit. Send them a card. Whatever that, whatever that may be, what guys, God lays somebody on your heart. And, and somebody said this a long time ago, and I, I've tried to take it to heart as, as often uh, as, as I think of it, but when God puts somebody on your mind, it's not by accident or mistake. You ought to do something for them. Pray for them. Call them. Send them a note. Somehow uh, encourage them. But if God puts them on your heart, there's probably a reason. And you may not know what it is, but listen to the Spirit leading and look for those opportunities to encourage one another to keep going and remain faithful to our God. Remember God's faithfulness. Call on God's promises obey God's instructions, listen to the exhortation of faithful friends. And then finally, number five, which is, I believe, the most important thing here, and it actually represents David's biggest mistake in my opinion. David failed to pray. And this is not the last thing on the list. It's, it should be the first thing on the list and all the way through the list, so to speak. Pray, pray, pray. From the very beginning, as David began to sense this, this feeling of hopelessness and the doubt began to creep into his mind, the first thing he should have done is cry out to God instead of reasoning in his own heart. Had he cried out to God in prayer, it would have changed the course of what was about to take place. And when we find ourselves in those moments of doubt, uh, the decisions that we, t that we make and how we respond to those temptations, they're going to determine the course that our lives will take. Will we continue to walk and follow the Lord or is our course going to divert and begin to go in this other direction? Prayer helps remove that sin-stained lens that doubt and fear puts over our lives. Prayer helps cleanse that, so to speak. It allows us to hear and to see more clearly what God intends for us to do pray. Our American culture and our church has put so little of a priority on prayer that for most people, it's nothing more than what we do before we eat and go to bed at night or an emergency when we, need, we want somebody to pray for us. But prayer is the channel through which God's power flows in our lives and through our lives. It's the channel through which God has given to us to be in constant communion with Him. And that's why we read in, in, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes, to pray without ceasing. 
to be in that constant communion with God. So whether it's, it's in the good times of life, on the mountain peaks of, of victories, or it's in the, in the valleys, or anywhere in between in life, we are in that f- communion with God. So it's not, oh, I forgot to pray, but it's that I'm always in that communion with God. So whatever may I encounter, God is right there. I am with the Lord in the midst of it. This morning, as you think about your own life, are you struggling with some measure of unbelief or doubt or lack of faith because of the circumstances that are going on around you or in your life? There are so many things globally, politically, and personally in all of our lives that are happening right now. It would be very, very easy for God's people to give place to that and to begin to go down this path in our own lives. And maybe it doesn't end in in theft and murder, but it takes you this path, this slippery slope. It's always taking you further and further away from the Lord. As we close this morning, would you take it to the Lord in prayer and stop that course of action from proceeding in your life? And then once you've prayed, begin taking steps to stay off that path in your own life. Would you bow your heads with me this morning as we, as we close? God, we, if our, we are honest with ourselves and before You, we all have struggled in this area of our lives at some point in time. Perhaps it's not the or the temptation of doubt or unbelief. Maybe it's some other sin, Lord, in our lives that that someone's dealing with. Sin always takes us further and further away from You. But we come and we approach the throne of glory as we've sung and as we've read this morning. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, His shed blood, robed in His righteousness, God, We humbly come before You and we seek help and grace and mercy in our times of need. Lord, You know each of our hearts and You know each of our lives. You know in intimate details. And it's more than just information to You, God, for You care. For You have been tempted in all the ways that we have. But thank You, God, it was without sin. Lord, You know what's going on in each of our lives. And I pray this morning in, in our lives, especially as those that may be struggling in a, in a great way in, in, in these areas, we turn our hearts to You. To look to You, to Your Word, to Your promises, to Your faithfulness. Lord, may we be encouraged this morning in the Lord. This is the, the, the truths of this message, though there's, uh, there's darkness and, and depression in, in the realities of seeing David's failures, but the hope of Jesus Christ, God, it, it, it brings encouragement to our lives. So no matter how great our struggle may be, we still have the hope and the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, may we be encouraged in You today. Encouraged to keep going, to not give up, to not give in to continue to walk faithfully following You. God, when it's all said and done, it will be all for Your praise and glory. And that's what we want to give ourselves to in this moment. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Steve's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Let's sing out this song of encouragement. It's a song of declaration. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. May our confidence and hope be placed in Him this morning as we close.